Well, good afternoon. Very nice to have you all here today. Uh, so today, our big theme for this month is learning about the history and the evolution of the piano. So taking the piano from the early stages of the piano to what it is today. So I'm going to be teaching you about that today. We're also going to be looking at the internal components or the, the way that a piano works, like an acoustic piano. So we'll be looking at the hammers to hit the strings and how all of that stuff works. It looks really complicated, but it's a very simple process. And I even built something to show to you today of exactly how it worked, even with the early types of systems like the clavichord, okay? All right, so. Uh, we are going to be rotating around to see some of the other uh, parts of the piano. So we're going to see an upright piano today. We're also going to see a grand or a baby grand piano. All right, so you've heard of a grand piano before, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we also have a baby grand piano. I have two in the living room, okay? What's the difference between a grand and a baby grand? I had to look it up. Go ahead. Is it smaller? Smaller, yes, right. So it usually goes to a six foot long, right? The actual box where all the strings are, but it gets past six feet. That's when they start calling it a grand piano. You want to know one of the biggest grand pianos I've ever seen? You guess how long it was? Ten, seven, eight, twelve. Twelve. It was twelve feet long. Twelve feet long. So it has a, a tremendous amount of sound comes out of it. They use it for big performances and that type of thing, okay? All right, so we'll be talking about the piano and moving up to it. So, uh, the modern piano is also called the piano forte. Now, we have heard both of those terms before, right? What does the word piano mean when we're playing music? Why? You want soft, it means something soft, right? What does forte mean? Wow. Wow, right. Yep, Cohen knew that, right? Okay, it means nice or loud. So piano forte means it's it can be it's soft and it's loud. It's loud and soft at right. the same time. Which it can be do yes. both, right? So also known as the piano forte. So it has a very long history uh, for coming up to what we have today. So the earliest type of piano was called the clavichord. Clavichord. Okay. We know what a chord is, right? You know what a chord is? What's a chord in music? It means uh, when we're playing. Right. Three notes combined. Yes, three notes two. combined or two. That's called a diatonic chord. Yes. Or right. uh, one an octave higher than the lower one playing a chord. Right. A big, uh, and we can also have chords that are broken, right? And we can play an arpeggio, right? Playing individual notes. So uh, the earliest one was called the clavichord, which was invented in the 14th century. So a very, very long uh, time ago. All right, now I'm going to show you an example of that on here. That's what the early clavichord looked like. So it was a wooden box and it had keys inside and those keys would come up and it would strike these long strings that were going across just like that. Yes. The color scheme is pretty much inverted. Right, it's inverted. You notice that, right? Where the black keys are, what color are those? White. White it's keys, black. and then the white keys are? Black. Black, black right? So they, they changed the color scheme, okay? So the clap chord was a small instrument. When instruments are small, they tend to be not very what? Yeah. Loud, okay. So it was very small. A lot of times it was this big. Now, not many keys on it either, right? That it's, looks very uh, different. Unless it's a flute or uh, a woodwind. Right, wind. right, and that they could be very loud, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's much smaller than the regular piano that we know of now, and it was primarily used for practicing and for private performances. Like if I just had a small group of people, <laughs> but the sound's not going to travel very much. Okay. It was very popular in the medieval time, uh, in the Renaissance, and also in the Baroque. Uh, periods as well. So some of our famous composers like Mozart, Beethoven, they probably would have still used that. Mozart said he loved that. He loved playing that. Okay. Um, so it's a lot smaller than the size of the piano and um, it's smaller also than the harpsichord, which I'm going to be talking about in a little bit. Yes. I actually like Beethoven better than Mozart. Don't let him know that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the clavichord produces sound through a mechanism called a tangent action. 
So when the key on the clavichord is pressed, it causes a small piece of metal or wood called a tangent to strike the string associated with that key, okay? So it would look something like this, all right? So there'd be like a piece of wood right here or a metal thing, sometimes they would use this brass blade and then it would come up and then it would hit the, the string on the top and then create a sound, okay? Now, sometimes some of these notes use the exact same string, which means some of these notes you couldn't play at the same time. Do you think that changed how music was written? Absolutely, right? Because you couldn't write some music that you could play on the piano, it wouldn't work on there because some of those notes you couldn't play at the same time, okay? Because they would use the same string. Yes? If you could, if you couldn't probably hold out the note very long because if you kept holding out the note, it wouldn't let the string vibrate. That's right, yeah. If you held it on there, the string, it would stop vibrating eventually, right? And it's not going to be very loud because that's a much smaller instrument, right? Um, so the tangent then stays in contact with the string, allowing it to vibrate and produce sound. And if you push really hard on the back part of it like this, it'll actually start to bend the, the, the string on there, and it'll cause the sound of the string to actually go up in pitch a little bit. So it created a neat effect to it, uh, but it was very limited with what it could do because it was small, the sound wouldn't travel very well, and um, you know, you couldn't play a lot of music that we can today, like with a piano, okay? So the clavichord's strings are arranged in pairs with one string for each key, okay? And those tangents, those things would come up and they would strike the strings that are uh, located at the back of the keys. And then when the key is pressed, the tangent is pushed forward to strike that corresponding key, uh, string. And then the strings of the clavichord were under a lot less tension, okay? Because they had to be in that wooden box like that. If I made a lot of tension on one of these strings, it might make the box start to come, come together like that, right? Now you notice like with a piano, like with a baby grand piano in the living room, it's a big metal piece, right? That all those strings are on and it's attached to wood, right? Um, it has to have lots of, of strength to be able to take all of that tension. Yes? Those little pegs at the top, at the top are uh -huh, like on, this. The, on the other side. Over here? Yeah, is that yep. like, like how you tune it? Maybe? Yes, that's how you tune it, yep, yep. And you will see something just like that in the pianos when, when you see that next after the presentation, is that you would take a tuning wrench and put that on the top and you'd make very small adjustments to it kind of like on a guitar where we have the tuning pegs, the same idea in order to get that string to shorten or lengthen depending on what you're trying to do with the, the tuning of the instrument, okay? All right, so that's how that clavichord works uh, with those strings are under low tension and allows the strings to continue to vibrate uh, freely on it. Uh, and it makes a much more softer and delicate sound because it's so much smaller and it has less tension on it. So the strings were made of brass uh, compared to the pianos that we're gonna see today, they have steel strings inside of those, okay? Um, so the clavichord's unique feature was called dynamic control. So that allowed the player to vary the volume and control of the notes by adjusting the pressure of the key. So if they pressed on the key just a little bit, it would come up and it would strike that string. If they hit it a lot harder, it would create a, a larger sound, right? Kind of like our pianos today, right? If you hit it much harder, it's gonna make a, a much louder sound. Um, and it was able to do that. Um, so they could do a lot more expression. What do we call those things when we, ex when we have expression in our sound? Like forte, piano. What do we call that? We call those, it starts with a D. Dynamics. dynamics, good. So dynamics, so that's like the power behind it, like dynamite, right? That means power, right? So that's the power behind, so you, you can make it big, you can make it small. And, um, and that's some of the things that you could do with the clavichord. Um, 
So it was very good for Baroque music of that era because it was having lots of expression and feeling. Uh, when Mozart would travel around, he could take his instrument with him, right? Okay, and set it up because you would just pop the lid open. You see a little string that keeps it from falling all the way open. And then he could play for a private performance for maybe just a couple of people. And then he could pack it up and then go on to the next place. So that's one of the reasons Mozart said he loved having a clapper for it. What's that? Could transport that? Yeah, it's only about, you know, three, four feet long. Mm -hmm. Yep, it was easy to take around with them. Yep. Kind of like a miniature keyboard of the day. Right, yep, that was like their digital keyboard of the day that you move around. And, yep. Um, it has the loudness of it, it has a range that's very small, right? How many keys do we have here? Well, if we go two, four, three, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, plus the uh, white keys in the middle. So we're probably around a 54, maybe 61, right, max, okay? So much smaller, so you're going to have less range, right? Much less range with a clavichord. Um, the durability was a, a little bit of a problem because it created... Um, you had to do lots of maintenance on it to keep all those strings in tune on there. Especially if you take an instrument and move it around a lot, what happens? It can wear out. The strings are gonna loosen a little bit, right? So it, it created a, um, a problem with lots of maintenance needed to keep it in tune and keep it playable. Um, the playing technique was very different than the keyboards that we have of today. You had to have very light touch or expression because if you hit it really hard, it didn't work very well, right? It would just kind of bounce off of those brass strings on there. Um, and it took a lot more skill to make this variety of different sounds on it. And there was lots of craftsmanship that was involved in building something like that. They didn't have all the machinery like, like we do today to mass produce things. Um, so uh, we're now going to hear an example of a clavichord play. And they still have some of these around. They're very old and some people have built them on um, off of designs. But I'm gonna have um, a person play that for you now. So, clavichord was working for that time. It was an instrument that people could use. And then someone says, I think we could do better, right? We're always trying to do better with our instruments and create an even better instrument. So, uh, a man decided to create the next thing called the harpsichord in the 15th century. Yes, Brandon. I think that um, actually almost like a gift. Card. It did. It kind of sounds to me like a banjo, didn't it? Yeah. Because of those types of strings, right? And did you see how it would hit the string from underneath? 
but they looked like they was, those might have been made out of wood. They could have been brass. Those were those tangents. That's the thing that came up and hit those strings. And it has a little fulcrum, so it goes like this, right? So when you hit the key, it goes up and it hits it, and then it drops back down. Okay. So the harpsichord was invented in around the 15th century, and it was a much larger and louder instrument. That looks a lot bigger, right? Do you think you could carry that around to other people's houses and play little, little things for them? No. Yes? Um, on my keyboard, there's different modes of instruments you can mm -hmm. play in the animal harpsichord. Yes. In fact, I'm going to show that to you in just a little bit. Yes. What else do you notice about this that we did not have with the clavichord? Two sets of keys. Two. Yeah, two sets of keys, just like that, right? And now, this is much bigger. are there instruments right now today that I have on this property, maybe next door, that has two sets of keys in it? Organ. Yeah, it's the organ, right? So that has two sets of keys on that, too. So there's two sets of keys. So it means it was two sets of strings, too, and they were stacked on top of each other, which allowed a lot more um, variants that they could play with the music, right? Yes, Xavier. It's made out of different material. Yep, made out of different material. It looks a lot sturdier than those little wooden boxes, right? The, the one that you just saw with that video, did that look old? Yes. Yeah, that definitely looked old. This looks like it's probably pretty sturdy, right? And it took a lot less maintenance as well. Uh, so this was very popular in the Renaissance and the Baroque period of time. Um, and it's similar in the, like the clavichord, that it has a keyboard with tangents that strike the strings, but it's larger and um, it produces a much louder, more powerful sound to it. Uh, the, harpsichord, uh, the harpsichord has a unique mechanism inside. So instead of that tangent just coming up and hitting the string, it has um, something that creates a plucking action. And that's what this is right here. What does that look like on there? Guitar pick. A guitar pick, that's right. And it's basically what they used was something like a guitar pick. And then it would come up and it would hit the string like this. Okay, hear that? Yeah. And that's how it worked, just like that. Okay? All right, I'm going to pass this around. Be very careful with it because it's fragile, okay? But I'm going to pass it around so you can see how that worked. Okay, and I have a place where that, where that sits for that fulcrum point to go up. So it goes over that string and then it would reset. There you go. Yes, B. Do you staple that? Huh? Do you staple that? I used a nailer gun and yeah, and nailed it down. Yes. Yep. All right. So uh, when the key is pressed, it has something called a plectrum that plucks the string on there, just like a guitar, like when we pluck the string on a guitar, and um, it stays in contact with the string and continues to vibrate and it produces a continuous sound until the key is released. Just like our piano, if we hold the piano key down, it will uh, allow that string to continue to ring for a little bit, right? And the harpsichord was typically, um, they had two sets of strings called registers, just like you see here in this picture, that allowed it to play different sounds. And this allowed the player to change the sound of the instrument to suit the kind of music that they were trying to play. And it was usually built in with a damper pedal as well, just like we have a damper pedal on our, our pianos today. And that allowed the player to sustain the notes, allow the notes to continue to ring out. Uh, Miss Melissa is going to be showing you that in just a little bit that we have when you hold the damper pedal down, you'll see this felt thing go up like this and it lifts off the strings, okay? Um, if you've ever played the, the guitar before and you do want, don't want that string to continue to vibrate, what do you do? Put your palm on it, right? And Or you touch that string to keep it from vibrating. When we were playing with the bells in here before, right? Remember that? We were playing with the hand bells well, last month when you were here. And when you wanted that bell to stop ringing, what did you do? Go like this, right? Or you put it down on the table and the table has a special felt on it to keep it from vibrating. So. Um, that's what that damper does. It allows the, the strings to continue to vibrate and then it stops it. Uh, one of the main advantages of the harpsichord over the clavichord was much louder, right? It was able to have much longer strings in there to create a, a, a bigger sound. And it was often used in orchestras, in chamber music, and also for solo playing. 
Um, but the harpsichord still had some limited dynamic range as well. Yes, go ahead. Um, they call the harpsichord because of the shape of it? Well, yes, it kind of looked like a harp inside. In fact, if you look at our modern pianos today, it also looks like a harp inside because of how the strings are set. So it looks like a big harp yeah, inside. Yep. Um, and um, the harpsichord, of course, was much less portable because you're not going to be able to carry that around very well. Um, but many, many different composers loved using the harpsichord. Okay. So now we're going to listen to uh, a man play the harpsichord. I've actually got to play on a harpsichord before at the college, and then I got yelled at because I wasn't supposed to touch it. But I got to play on it because I'm like, hey, I'm going to take this opportunity and do this. It's a really neat instrument. <coughs> What do you notice about these keys? Yeah, where did we see this before? Kinsley. Um, there are other keys on top. Yep. <clears throat> yep, it has two sets of keys on there. The clavichord was like this too, right? You would expect these keys to be white and these keys to be black, but it's the opposite, right? I've even seen some of them where the keys were red. So the keys were red and then the other keys were white. I've seen that too. How much longer? About five more minutes. Okay. okay. All right. So that's what a, a harps accord sounds like. I'm not now going to have Ashlyn come over and I have one of our pianos set up so it sounds like a harps accord so you'll get to hear it in the oh, room here. This one, right? This one, yep. And I'm just playing it. Play anything right you want, yep. <laughs> adjustable action in there so when you play the harpsichord function it actually has the same weight to it like you play in a regular harpsichord. Very cool. All right so that is the harpsichord so that was the next version of there we go good. All right so that was the harpsichord. Then we had a man named Bartolomeo Cristofori that was an Italian harpsichord maker and inventor who said, I think we can do more with this. Um, so he created an instrument called the 
Ravi Cimbalo Col Piano e Forte, which translates from Italian, which I just butchered, uh, to harpsichord with soft and loud. Real original, right? So uh, that's what he created. And he was, uh, he was born in Italy, began working as a harpsichord maker in France when he was around 23 years age. And he went to work for a really famous family called the Medici family, very rich family that was powerful and influential in Italy at that time. And he was appointed as the keeper of the instruments at the, uh, for the Grand Prince, Ferdinando de uh, Med Medici. So he was in charge of the instruments and uh, he decided to invent the piano and that was a big, significant development in the history of the instruments. Um, the harpsichord was definitely very popular, but it did have some limitations in its dynamic range, right? We talked about dynamics, which is that loud and soft, right? So you really couldn't get that if you just got one sound, right? Okay, you had some, some softness that you could do with it, but it was a little harder to control but he wanted some more dynamics in a keyboard type of an instrument. So, this piano, yes? One, those keys look kind of orange. And yeah. two, is this when they decided to change the color key, the color scheme? Yes, apparently he didn't like the color pattern, so he changed it, yes. <coughs> yep, and um, he wanted something that had a better ability to play soft piano, right, piano, and uh, loudly the forte. Uh, so he achieved this by replacing the plectrum action, which is what, what we saw in the harpsichord, that function right there. Okay, he replaced that with a hammer strike. So instead there was a little hammer that would come up and hit the, uh, the string, similar to what? The first clavichord, right? So we went back to that. So that's what he created and um, so now we have something that has a lot more expression in it, which is known as our um, piano of today. I'm going to I'm going to have you listen to just a small little section of the one of the oldest pianos next. Okay. It sounds okay. like a harpsichord mixed with the piano. It does, yeah. yeah. It's not as loud as what we have today, but it was much louder than harpsichord. Yes? Notice how all of these older instruments tend to have the same guitar-ish sound. They do. Yes, they do. Okay. All right. And of course, now we have our digital pianos. Okay. I'm going to show you how the action of a modern day piano works. So if I hit my key down here, you'll see a little hammer right down inside there. It comes up and it hits the string. In fact, in this case, it actually is hitting three strings that are all tuned to the, to the same note. And that helps to increase some of the volume. You'll see inside of the box part of the piano, we have all of those strings. Kind of looks like a harp, how it's shaped. Uh, you will notice that we have uh, this piece on top here as well. This is called a damper. So if I just hit a string normally without a pedal, as soon as I let go of the string, or I, I'm sorry, as soon as I let go of the key, uh, the hammer drops off of the string, and then that damper comes back down and quiets the string. It mutes the string. If I hold my pedal down, you'll notice that those dampers come up. I'll get a little closer. You see how they come up. So now if I hit that string, it will continue to ring until I let go of that pedal. So that is the basic actions of a piano. In this case, this is a, uh, a grand or a baby grand piano. So the hammer is hitting from the bottom. You'll also see some uprights and those hammers will strike uh, crossed and hit the string uh, because the strings are up and down.